My name is Amy Davis Roth. Many of you know me as Surly Amy. I'm a skeptic. I write for the wildly popular blog, skeptic.org. I'm also the managing editor for Mad Art Lab, which is a website that deals with the intersection between art and science and skepticism. And I'm also an artist. I'm a photographer, a painter, and I make jewelry that encourages critical thinking. How did you get the name Surly? It's because of the business I sort of got that nickname, so I sort of get this reputation for being Surly and Henri, but it's really not true at all. No. It's because of the business, Surly Ramix, people started calling me Surly Amy, and it just stuck, yeah. But now I, I'll respond to that if you call me that. I thought maybe there was some cool pottery No, no term. nothing cool about it. It was a, <laughs> no. Actually, it's a play on words, you know, like the word ceramics, and uh, when my husband, who was my boyfriend at the time, we were like, how are we going to come up with a cool name, you know, for a ceramic business? And I was, uh, I had a lousy attitude at the time. I was a waitress and uh, I wasn't producing much art so I was unhappy. And so I kind of had a reputation for being surly. So we were just joking around, oh, surly Ramix, a play on words, right? Yeah. But uh, it stuck. It was one of those things that was really funny for about five minutes and then somehow stuck long term. But that's how I got the nickname, yeah. It's, uh, it's about attitude. It was definitely jewelry with attitude. So that's how, how it got that name. What kind of jewelry do you make? I make hand-formed and hand-painted ceramic jewelry and I sort of did a reaction to all the necklaces that I saw uh, the women wearing that said things like princess and baby doll and all that crap and I wanted to sort of create something that empowered women and made them think critically, be more intelligent, something that was better representation of who we are. And so that started me creating stuff like that and then I found the skeptical movement which I got really excited about. And I started making pieces that had to do with science and education. It sort of has uh, evolved from that original point, which was to make jewelry that w wasn't insulting to who we were. When did you become a card-carrying skeptic? Um, I really got excited about physics. And I had n absolutely no scientific background at all. So I went out and I got a couple DVDs. And one of, one of them was called What the Bleep Do We Know? And the other one was The Elegant Universe by Brian Greene. So what I had done sort of accidentally was I had two DVDs, one which was complete crap, and the other which was, had actual information. But I enjoyed both of them, and at the time I didn't know which was the crap. So I started searching online. I wanted to learn more about science, and I, that was right when uh, podcasts were just coming out. And so I did a search online, and I found uh, Skeptic's Guide to the Universe and Skepticality in my Search for Science podcast and I got really hooked on it and through listening to that I, I learned what pseudoscience was and I learned what real science was and I found out which video was you know, that I had watched which was nonsense which is what the bleep do we know don't don't believe a goddamn word out of that video but that's how it got started it was really I, I really thank the podcasting community for helping me become a skeptic and did you bike here I'm just curious I did my bike is right over there <laughs> all right so usually I'm a little more dressed up for these occasions. When I was talking about spandex, I didn't realize it was going to carry over into today. <laughs> do you do a podcast? So I, I've been on quite a few podcasts because people will ask me to say nonsense, like what you know, I'm doing right here. But uh, I don't currently have a podcast. Just the blog, and we do a lot of outreach and activism where we try to encourage... Like, for example, we uh, support vaccinations, so we will organize vaccine clinics at a lot of the major science fiction conferences and try to reach out to the general population to teach people about vaccine safety and why it's important to get your Tdap booster, things like that. So we've, we've sort of crossed over. We do a lot of the skepticism where we encourage the critical thinking, but then we also try to do activism that has to do with feminism and, and outreach and you know, encourage people to understand the difference between real medicine and alternative medicine. How did you get involved with the Skeptics? So I was listening to Skeptics Guide to the Universe and I heard Rebecca Watson and she was the first person that I really felt like I could identify with. It was really kind of an important thing. A lot of the, the founding members of Skepticism were a lot of men and there wasn't really anyone that I identified with. I, I sort of identified with Swoopy on Skepticality and she was a big influence on me. But then uh, when I heard Rebecca, I was like, wow, this. This is a chick that I could actually be friends with. And since I was making the jewelry, what I did is I reached out to her. And I sent her an email and I said, hey, you know, I'm like this geeky art chick that, you know, makes jewelry. Can I send you some stuff? And she's like, oh man, yeah. And so I sent her a box of jewelry and then she, uh, she handed it out to all the, the skeptics that were writing for the blog at the time. And it was really great. And they were so wonderful and so receptive of the work that I was doing that they asked me if I would put my stuff on the skeptic table at a TAM. 
And for anyone that's not familiar with TAM, it's the Amazing Meeting. And it's this awesome conference on science and critical thinking and like everybody who's anybody in the movement goes. And to be invited to put your stuff on a table was like, wow, it was huge for me. So I did that and I went to the event and I helped out with all the stuff that they had going on and apparently I was a good worker. <laughs> Because uh, at some point, Rebecca asked me if I'd like to contribute to the blog, and so that's how I got, I got involved. It's really, I think, I, I give a lot of credit to Rebecca for, for being so receptive and awesome, but uh, it's important to reach out and get involved. And if you want to get, you know, you want to get involved in the skeptical community, reach out to one of us, because you'd be surprised at how receptive and wonderful all the people are. How the hell does a blog work? You yeah, write like, things and then you post them and then they're on this thing. It's called the internet. It's awesome. Is there anything now like, there's, like Amy? We haven't seen an article from you in a couple. Yeah, of actually, we do have blog rules, and uh, it's very much like you would run. I think any typical newspaper. We have uh, specific articles that you know we contribute to. Like for example, I do an atheist and skeptical uh, advice column called Ask Surly Amy, and that gets published every Monday. And then I do an AI, which is. Uh, an afternoon inquisition where we reach out to the community and I do that every Tuesday so we do have deadlines and we have times when things are supposed to go up. The only difference is, is we don't get paid. <laughs> we do this all as volunteer work. So, but yeah, it's just you have to organize it that way in order for it to to stay popular because your readership is really important to you and it's like anything else they expect to have things posted at a certain time so that, you know, it's partially entertainment, you know, we want, and we want to keep the readers happy, so what is the product of skepticism? You know, I think about this a lot. It and can't I, just be not bullshit. Yeah, okay, this is how, and I, I thought about this a lot before I came and talked to you, because I've sort of seen the rough edit of what you've been doing, and it kind of comes across, whether you want it to or not, as a bit of a self-help kind of a product, right? It's almost like, it, it almost comes across... We can see. Yeah, in a really weird way, and I don't like that idea, because I don't want it to seem like a club or a cult or a religion or anything like that at all. So how I try to look at it is skepticism is sort of like an armor. It's sort of like part of your arsenal uh, for street smarts. And that's what skepticism is. Because it used to be that you would just be on the street, right? And snake oil salesmen would come up to you and try to sell you something. But the street has expanded in our world now. And it encompasses the television and it and the street and, and the internet. And there's so many things coming at you in so many different directions trying to sell you stuff. And a majority of it's bullshit because we're in this sort of free market, right? So you're gonna have to expect that a lot of crap is coming at you. And what skepticism can do is it can, it can help you discern what is true from what you want to be true. So I look at it like you know a protective piece of armor and it just adds to your street smarts. You know, instead of me deciding that I think something is right based on my own personal preferences or my biases that I might have, I can rely on the skeptical method and all and this huge network of scientists and skeptics to help me figure out what evidence is valuable and what is empirically, you know, something I can trust as opposed to just what I want to believe. You know, I, we'd all like to think that the secret and positive thinking and all that, you know, it's true. Like if I think that I'm awesome, I'm going to be awesome and everything's going to work out for me. But realistically, that's not the case. So that's how I look at it. That's the product. It's a safety net. It's, you know, it's a way of understanding. It's a method that's sort of like the scientific method, but for lay people. It's the same sort of a thing. And it will help protect you from losing money and getting taken advantage of. And that's why we try to encourage more people to understand it and get involved. Because it really can help you and your family. And I hope that didn't sound like a self-help book. <laughs> no, no. Because it kind of... It's just there is a fine line between selling a tool and selling self-help. Right. Like, yeah. It, it's a method that will really help make your life better if you learn how to use it. So that's how I look at it. What form of bullshit pisses you off the most? Hmm. I guess that I would have to say what annoys me the most is all the products and the the things that are sort of geared towards women, um, all the bullshit products that don't work. The secret is something that really bothers me because it creates a cycle of self-blame that's primarily directed towards women. There's not a lot of men that are really involved in this, and so I guess that's why it gets it gets me upset. Um, it, it's the, you know, the idea that like if, you, if something bad happens in your life that it was your own fault. 
that bothers me. Uh, what also really bothers me is the, the anti-vaccination movement because that is literally putting the entire world at risk. Um, it's actually making people sick because there's so much misinformation being spread about vaccines either causing autism or being poisonous in some way or too many vaccines at once can hurt you and and this defies any of the facts that we know about medicine in fact vaccines have probably saved more lives than anything other than hand washing i mean it's probably one of the number one medical advancements that our species has known and the fact that people are going around encouraging women not to vaccinate their children is something that breaks my heart and it's really something that we try to fight against the other stuff with like the haunted houses and the psychics you know that stuff to me isn't as pressing as the issues that can actually you know harm someone psychologically or or kill you know newborn babies i think that's where we need to focus our energy on now um of all the bullshit flim flam whatever out there mm -hmm. um what um, what is your favorite word? No. <laughs> no, okay. Actually, that is my question. Uh, that is a question I always ask. I was going to get to that one, but let's just do that one Inside now. Inside the Skeptic it? Studio. Yeah, what, do you, what, what do you call bullshit? What do I call bullshit? Like, what's your favorite word? For it's it? just bullshit. Yeah, that's a good word. I don't really care for the whole woo-woo thing. That sounds kind of silly. I mean, call it like you see it. It's bullshit. That's what it is. What bullshit, if it could be true, would you want to be true? Oh, okay, yeah. Ghosts, man! Like, seriously! Who wouldn't want to be able to talk to their grandma again, right? That would be so cool. I mean, I wouldn't want people stuck in some sort of crazy purgatory or something where they're like stuck and they're see-through and it's miserable. But if there was a way to communicate with, you know, dead people, or if there was, you could believe that there was an afterlife, that'd be lovely. I, I don't believe in any of it, but I guess if I was going to pick, it would be that. Or being psychic would be fun as hell, because then, or mind reading, like, I know what you're thinking, that would be fun. But yeah, I, I guess if anything were to be real, sure, you know, to think that, you know, you can hug your granddad again, that would be great. You don't want magic water? No, because the, the medicine that, you know, it is, it is, it, like, herbal medicine, like, like, like aspirin, it's willow bark. I mean, that stuff, the natural remedies become remedies if they actually work, you know? But, uh, but the dudes, they always go for the supernatural powers. Or aliens. Oh, really? Oh, aliens. Well, that could potentially actually be true. I mean, we can't, the jury's still out on that. I don't think we've been visited yet, but, there, I mean, there's absolutely, statistically, the possibility that there's life on other planets. We oh, just yeah. haven't found them yet. You know? I think they're talking more the uh, X Files. They now. want the X Files, yeah. Mulder was cool. <laughs> How do you feel about gorilla skepticism? Well, I, I'm very fond of gorilla art in general, which is um, where, where someone will go and tag a billboard or something and, and change the message. I'm all for that. In fact, there was this really wonderful billboard that was on the New York subway. I, I think it said 100,000 New Yorkers believe in God or something like that and someone went underneath it and scribbled it out and, and did the math and it was like 0.00002% of New Yorkers like instead of making it seem like it was this big huge number instead of it being I think it was 200 or it was 200,000 New Yorkers agree and the guy did the math and that was like this tiny fraction of an amount so that kind of guerrilla skepticism I'm all for that that's fantastic um, other types of guerrilla skepticism, I suppose you, you know, you have to weigh the pros and the cons. Like, are you um, causing harm by what you're doing or are you helping? And how far is your message reaching? There's so many parameters that I would have to take it on a case-by-case -case situation before I could pass any judgment. Would you approach a stranger? Would I, what, I do all, what do you mean approach a stranger and like say, a, hey, how's it going? For some reason, I, like, I got, for instance, I mean, I work at Starbucks, okay. and anytime I see anyone wearing a power balance bracelet, yeah. I'm like, oh, by the way, that, that doesn't, doesn't work. work. Yeah, I do that. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I do that. Um, I don't think that's really harming anybody. It might upset them a little bit. I just, I think you have to be careful that, I mean, a lot of the people that believe in things, they're just like you and me. Everyone has crazy beliefs, right? So you have to approach people with kindness and in, in a way that is not, they're not gonna shut off. You have to be careful with that because if you just tell somebody they're wrong, chances are they're gonna believe more in what they already believed than when you said that. But if you just drop in hints like, oh hey, that bracelet that you have on, yeah, I had one of them, but um, I found out they didn't work. Here's a website that'll explain it to you. You know, you should save your money. Like yeah. be nice about it. You don't have to be like, hey, idiot. 
bracelet doesn't work, but the guys that sell it, you know, I've yelled at those guys before. Because they know they're pulling a scam. You know, that's the difference. Like, if they're selling the stuff, then I think they're fair game. And that's how I feel about the whole psychic industry, too. The big time psychics that are collecting money or actually causing harm or have media attention, I think those are the people that we should direct our energy towards. But the true believers, we have to um, be a little bit more careful because they're, they're just misled and they don't, know, they don't know the truth. What's your stance on the whole Phil Plate, don't be a dick thing? I don't even know how to comment on all that. I mean, the whole don't be a dick thing started before Phil Plate. It was Will Wheaton was the one that started that whole thing. And then Phil picked up on it and sort of used that same the same tagline and Rebecca Watson used the same tagline for some videos on don't be a dick and I mean you'd have to be more specific with your question like yeah I think that there's an awful lot of debate going on about how we should act and I get a little annoyed because again I don't think skepticism is a club it's a method and some people are going to approach it in different ways and it's not up to me to pass a lot of judgment you know I can say what I think is best like with how to deal with psychics that I can say what I think is best but I really can't tell somebody else how to act and I think Phil's message was more that he just thought people should be cool to each other and it got a little blown out of proportion well then let me get specific do you think that a debate over temperament is alienating people yes sure I think that you but but it's such a big community that it's okay if people break off into little groups. Like, yes, absolutely. I think skepticism began as sort of a solidarity of a bunch of, of people who started it and then disagreements have broken out and, and people feel different ways about different things and it's fractioning off and that's okay. There's room for everybody. You can believe that you should act a certain way and deal with skeptics in a certain way and go and still do skepticism. And so can we, we can do our thing too. So I, I don't think it's that big a deal. You know, but maybe a little less armchair philosophizing and a little more getting shit done would be helpful, yeah. Tell me about being a woman in the skeptic community. Okay, um, right now there is a skewed, and it's an atheism too. It, it's in a lot of these, um, these sort of groups where women are, you know, the minority, and that's a fact. Women are a minority in a lot of male-driven industries science, uh, technology. So yes, we have to actively encourage women and other minorities to get more involved in the movement. And we sort of have to go out of our way to do that. And, and people get upset about that. They think it's gonna naturally work itself out, but it's not. And, and like my explanation of how I got involved in skepticism is really has so much to do with the fact that I identified with a woman who was in a public stance in skepticism. I identified with her and that is why I got involved. And I hope that when people see me and there's other young women out there, that they will want to get involved as well. So we need to put more people up in front than are not currently represented. That's more minorities and more women. You know, there's so many Any other questions about that? Because I'd be happy to talk about it. <laughs> What did you think of Brian Dunning's album cover? I would prefer not to drag him through the dirt because I actually like Brian Dunning as a person. I think he made a terrible um, decision when he put out that piece of art. And I believe that it was probably unintentional. I, in fact, I'm pretty confident that it was unintentional. He's a nice guy. He, he was making a cool project and he had for some reason decided that it would be cool to put a naked woman on her knees while he stood you know, above her dismissively, and it sent a terrible message to women. And not all women agree with me, and that's great too, but really, when, you put, when you're that strong of a public figure and you put something like that out, somewhere, some woman is gonna think that, oh, well, I don't really belong in this movement because I'm sort of being treated like an object here. If that's how skepticism sees me, and they see me as, like, she was supposed to represent the woo, yeah. too, which was also insulting. It, it means that the women are less intelligent, the women are just objects. These are all messages that we're getting sent. And, you know, intentional or not, we need to do better because we know better, right? So we need to be careful about the messages that we send and the things that we do. And, it's, you know, it sort of sounds like I'm on the, you know, the let's critique how we should act thing. And you can argue that point. Uh, but we, yeah, yeah, I just think that when, if you're trying to encourage more women to get involved, and this is a, a movement about critical thinking, then we need to critically analyze the way we're portraying women in our movement. 
Would you not want a sexy naked person on your album cover? Well, not even that, okay? Because uh, if in that particular situation, it, it's all about context, right? If, it, if he had placed a, a naked woman that he didn't know on the cover, that's fine. I don't have a problem with that. The problem that I have is the context that she's sure. being placed below a man who's fully clothed. What decision was that about? He wanted to parody a Fleetwood Mac album, but, yeah. but that actual album, um, Stevie Nicks is fully clothed, they're, they're dancing, it's, it's not like she's in a, in a lower position. Now, if he had taken that same art that he put out, exactly like it is, and then on the flip side, he was naked and on his knees and she is in a suit above him, then fine and dandy, you know, that's, then it's funny. It's not about nudity, it's about context and it's about the message that you're sending. So you just have, if you're gonna think critically about all these other things, you're gonna have to start thinking critically about art and the messages that you're sending with what you're producing. Does art or can art even have a message? No. You can infer that there's a message if you want. And that's the same thing with him. You can say the artist is dead, right? So say Brian Dunning put out that piece of art and then dropped dead, <laughs> right? You still have this piece of art. Now it's up to you to decide what that art means to you. And like I said, a lot of people are going to infer that that's placing women in a lower stance, right? So does all art have meaning? Um, only if you want it to, I suppose. And if you want to be blind to the situation, you can be blind to the situation. You know? It's called blind privilege. Look it up online. I will. Speaking of nudity, when are we going to have another skeptic calendar? Well, the thing with the sketchy calendar is it was, a, it was a great project and um, it did a lot of good and it helped pay to get, get women to TAM a couple times. But a lot of other people are doing calendars. It's not, there's like a lot of geek girl calendars now being produced and we're not sure if we're going to do it again just simply because the market sort of flooded with this sort of stuff. Yeah, there's a geek girl calendar and there's a lot of people doing it. We might do it again. It was really fun. I liked those calendars. And so we try to keep it fair. There is a skip chick and a skip dude calendar. See, it's not about being naked. Okay, everyone can get naked. Uh, <laughs> Don't put that in the video. <laughs> uh, right. How inclusive is skip chick? Actually, we've um, become a whole network now. So it's now the skip chick network. And we have uh, skip chick in Swedish. We're going to be starting a Spanish one. We also have Mad Art Lab, the one that I'm in charge of. And there's more men on that than there is women. So, and they all write about skepticism too. So we're really trying to branch out. Oh, we have teen skeptic because we really want to encourage the younger people to think critically and get more involved in stuff. So yeah, we have a whole network. Um, we, we aren't trying to alienate. Again, it's the situation where there was less women in skepticism. And so we specifically try to reach out to other women to get them involved. If there were less men in skepticism, you know, we would be reaching out to try to get more men involved. But currently, until things are equal, we have to still, you know, try to reach out to these people that aren't that aren't aware of what's happening. What does the future hold for Skeptic? World domination. <laughs> Next question. Like near future. <laughs> um, partial guys, world domination. What do you guys um, have up your sleeve this year or the next couple of years? Um, well, right now we're yeah. getting ready to do Skepticon, which is which is at Convergence. <laughs> so right now we're organizing Skepticon, which is a conference in Minnesota that is in combination with a big science fiction conference. And so we create a skeptic track. It's sort of like what they do at DragonCon, if you're familiar with DragonCon. Yeah. Derek and Swoopy, they put together this really fantastic skeptic track. And they have all these panels. So Skeptic tries to do the same thing, but at a smaller event in Minnesota. And this is, I think, the third year we've done it. It's really great. We get PZ Myers to come out. We get um, Amanda Marcotte. Like, we have all these really great people coming out to give talks on evolution and talks on science and skepticism. And we're going to do a lot of panels on art this year, like uh, when art meets science and uh, a, a lot of really great things. So that's what, currently what we're working on. Uh, we're also organizing a couple different vaccine clinics, and I don't know if I'm allowed to say where they're happening yet, but until we get the final approval from the CDC and everyone, but uh, those are in the works, so we're, we're doing a lot of that. Uh, and like I said, we're expanding the network, so there's gonna be you know, a lot more skeptics writing and hopefully a lot of different languages so that we can, you know, we can reach people all over the place. That's pretty much our goal right now. Do you ever do any princess unicorn artwork on request? Oh, I do invisible pink unicorns all the time, yeah. But you know, I start, well, you know what that is, right? That's like the argument, okay, invisible pink unicorn is sort of like the argument that when people say, well, you can't prove that there's not a god. 
Okay, well, you can't prove that there's not an invisible pink unicorn standing next to me right now. So, in my garage. Yeah, it's ex yeah, the Carl Sagan dragon in my garage from yeah. yeah. And, um, and it's the same as the flying spaghetti monster. So the invisible pink unicorn is very similar to that. It's that same sort of argument. So yeah, I make those. But I did start off, you know, making all kinds of stuff. I've even made crosses for people that have specially requested them, you know. But uh, I don't do that stuff anymore because I, I just don't feel right about it. I don't feel like promoting that. But um, I, I do do customers for people all the time. And I'm not going to withhold art from someone, you know. That would be cruel. <laughs> You know, I try not to do, I don't want to do crosses, but I, I, I'll draw you a fairy, sure. I mean, why not? There's some funny skeptic history with fairies, like those really famous photographs that they did where they, they did a wonderful job of like cutting out paper and putting a fairy and taking a photo and making it look like it was really there. So, like, sure. Prior to skepticism, were you a true believer? Were you a hippie? What? Um, I, I'm sure that you could argue that I was a hippie, but, um, I was never religious. I, I was raised in a, in a family with no religion. Uh, I'm sure that I fell prey to a lot of, you know, the wishful thinking. And I'm sure that there was a point in my life where I thought I was psychic. You know, you, you think you know when your friend calls and you knew it was her and you're like, oh my God, I'm so psychic. And you're like, no, you're not. That's just confirmation bias, idiot. But I didn't know that then, you know. I didn't know statistics then. That, I have like five friends and eventually you're going to know when one of them calls and then you're going to forget all the times when you picked up the phone and you didn't know who it was. Stuff like that. So yeah, I fell prey to a lot of that stuff. Do you have any tats where you were like, oh man, my goofy past? No, not at all. I love, I love them all. I got no regrets. No, not at all. Yeah. They're just drawings, man. What would Jesus do? Yeah, right now. No, I was never into religion. I always never, yeah. I always thought it was silly. I grew up in a family that there was no talk of religion ever. In fact, one time I was, I, I was at my mom's house and I'm reading a book. She's like, what are you reading? I'm like, the Bible. And she started laughing hysterically, just walked out of the room. I'm like, what's so funny? And yeah. Do you think skepticism can be applied to something like God? I think that you can apply skepticism to religion. And a lot of people disagree, but I think if you're going to use the skeptical method to analyze the whole God thing, you can come to the conclusion that there's just not enough evidence for you to believe that there is a God. Um, I know that there's a lot of people that don't agree with that, and uh, there's a lot of people that feel that there's room for theists to be in the skeptical movement, and I agree with that. I don't think that you have to be skeptical about everything. You know, we everyone has their sacred cow, I suppose. Um, but I personally think that if you are skeptical about it, then you're going to have to come to the conclusion that there is no God. That's my take on it, you know. And I, I would like to encourage people to be more skeptical about religious claims because they, uh, they take advantage of a lot of people. You know, it's sad. Did Mr. Deity, did I tell you this? We were, we were at a rapture event, right? Me and Rebecca were in San Francisco and there was a rapture. It was like, you know, the rapture thing where was the there was, one? yeah, there was the, that Harold Camping guy said the world was gonna yeah, end. Yeah, we were right here. Yeah, yeah, okay, well, we went up to this atheist conference in, um, in San Francisco in Berkeley, or maybe it was Oakland, but anyway, he was giving a talk and it was right at the time, you know, when the world was supposed to end and all of a sudden there was like a 3.6 earthquake in the room while Mr. Deity was giving his talk. It was the funniest thing ever. You get this like crowd of atheists and they're all applauding because it was, it was hilarious. God caused an earthquake that day. <laughs> Awesome. It was really fun. It was a really great moment. And he just stopped for a minute. He looked around. He sort of giggled and he just went on with his talk. It was, it was fun times. <laughs> with so much pressure to produce content, do you often find your foot in your mouth? Find those sure. You're like, Damn. Yeah, we're just, we're just human. You know, we all make mistakes. That's, that's one of the main reasons I am a skeptic. It's because I know that I'm flawed and I'm not that smart and I don't have the best education and I'm gonna do and say stupid things. But skepticism helps me do and say stupid things less. <laughs> you know, it really gives me something I can fall back on and it's something that I can like critically analyze the situation. But yeah, we all make mistakes. And one of the things that makes a skeptic a stronger person is your ability to say you're wrong. 
you know? Like, we all make mistakes. Like, I talk a big game about equality, right? And I raised $4,000 or more, actually, to get women to go to the amazing meeting this year because there's not enough women in skepticism. So I raised all this money. But you know what I did? I got all white women to go because I reached out to my little circle of people and I feel really bad about that. I made a mistake about that. I should have tried harder to reach out and get more women of color involved in you know the grant program and next year I'll do that. But I think it's important to realize your mistakes. It makes you stronger. And yeah, say stupid shit, it's okay. We're, we're gonna do it, you know? I don't understand what was controversial about the last skeptic party at TAM. The main critique was that we called it a bordello party and some, a few small group of people, I guess, got upset because they said it sounded sexist. So it's just a party. We thought it was funny. It was in Vegas, so. We don't have a party scheduled for this year. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, okay. We're, we're still um, hoping that we're going to be able to pull something together, but there's no party this year um, because well, not yet anyway. We haven't announced anything, or maybe. But for one thing, there's a big, huge pen party this year. How can you compete with bacon and donuts and strippers, right? <laughs> Any final thoughts? Surlyramics.com, <laughs> check out my website. I make a ton of really great science and skeptically influenced artwork that you can wear around your neck. Surlyramics.com, check me out. It's how I make a living. Speaking of that, uh... It's a trilobite. 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 Yeah. Trilobite. Trilobite. Trilobite, um, they're fossils. These little critters used to exist all over the place, and there's a, a lot of fossils of them, and they're really great to collect because there's so many of them because they had really hard shells. Yeah. Awesome critters that no longer exist. They would be from this size, like all the way up to this size. Trilobites are cool. Uh, what I like about them is that they can self destruct at any moment. But at the same time, ceramics are one of the oldest artifacts that we find. So they could also last 4,000 years and you could dig them up somewhere, yeah. So that's, to me, what I love about, I love about the, te the temporariness that they could just that's, burst into flames at any moment. Okay. Thanks, thanks for having me and thanks for encouraging people to, you know, be critical thinkers. And be skeptical, bitches. Come with me if you want to live. Be skeptical. You should totally be skeptical. Be skeptical. <laughs>